Do you ever have those moments where you read something or see something and then all of a sudden this thing that you've never paid much attention to is now showing up everywhere? That's how I felt after I read the book titled Masterpiece by Kelly Murphy with my daughter a few years ago. In this book, there's a series of paintings titled Prudence, Fortitude, Justice, and Temperance. God evidently knew that I needed some work in the area of virtue because ever since, these words seem to be popping up everywhere. So before I have my guest expert share with you all how we can grow in virtue and why we need it, here's a quick summary for anyone who is new to understanding the word virtue. Virtue, as defined by the Catechism, is a habitual and firm disposition to do good. Faith, hope, and love, or sometimes called charity, are the three theological virtues as they are oriented toward our relationship with God. They are supernatural. Prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude are known as the cardinal virtues, or sometimes called moral virtues. Of course, there are many more, but this gives you a quick sense of some foundational virtues you can pray for. These virtues help us to put things in right order so that we can not only do good sporadically, but in all situations at all times. For virtue will not only improve what we do, but who we are. Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome to the Persistence in Prayer podcast hosted by Catholic mindset coach, wife, mother, educator, and speaker, Kylie Hine. Kylie is passionate about helping you deepen your relationship with God through the power of prayer. This podcast is a space for high achievers who want to do it all, but also want to prioritize their spiritual life and grow in faith. Join us as we explore the beauty of persistence in prayer and the transformative impact it can have on our lives. Get ready to discover practical tips, insights, and inspiration to help you develop a daily prayer practice and cultivate a deeper sense of trust in God's plan for your life. Let's journey together towards a more fulfilled and faithful life as we invite the Holy Spirit in. Let's begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, I am joined by Rose Folsom. Rose is a convert, lay Dominican, and founder of the Virtue Connection Program. She ran a calligraphy business for many years that included doing commissioned work for John Paul II and Queen Elizabeth. She later served as director of a White House office that landed her at Pope Benedict's birthday celebration during his Washington visit. Today, Rose coaches Catholic professionals to a consistent, focused prayer life that gives them more clarity and peace in their lives. Rose lives just north of D.C. with Fred, her husband of 42 years. Rose, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Kylie, thank you so much for inviting me. It is especially a pleasure for me to talk with you because I kind of feel we're soul sisters in a way. Yes. Amen. I remember when I first discovered you and your website and your program, and I remember reading through it and thinking, this is very much the trajectory where I feel like God is calling me just to help people to grow in holiness, to grow in prayer, and to grow in virtue. And I can't wait to learn more about that from you and the way that you are helping people to understand that, especially for this particular audience of high achievers, where sometimes it can feel very difficult to fit prayer in to the busyness of what we feel called to do. Before we begin, I would love to hear, just for the sake of curiosity, when I saw that you ran a calligraphy business and included work for John Paul II and Queen Elizabeth, what did that look like? It was. Okay, so the, the Queen Elizabeth, I did calligraphy for her twice. And I lived, you know, my business was in Washington, D.C., so... She came to visit in 1976, and I've forgotten when the second time was, in the early 90s, I think. And I was commissioned by two different organizations who were hosting her for an event to do a presentation piece for her. So I actually have a piece, I have a photograph of her looking at my artwork. It was kind of cool. It was a, it was a passage from King Lear. That is fascinating and so exciting. <laughs> and when John Paul II, it was the calligraphy for a book of prints that a uh, uh, a Dominican nun friend of mine had done, and uh, I did the calligraphy and, and bound the book together as a presentation piece for him, and I also have a picture of him looking at my work. So you are a convert. Was this work done prior to becoming Catholic? Let me think. So I was received into the church in 1990, so it would have been sort of half and half. Okay. Yeah, definitely John Paul II was after because one of my 
dear friends, recently passed away, Sister Mary Grace was a cloistered nun and I actually became friends with her. That's another story. But she was an artist and she had a lot to do with my development as a Catholic. Okay, wonderful. I can't wait to hear more about that story as we continue. Many of my listeners are cleric or melancholic, so they are natural born leaders, but also perfectionists. They have very high ideals of themselves. And I know one of the things that you help to strive people to understand is that while leadership courses build skills, only virtue gives us the core strength to be a leader that people trust and respect and want to follow. What is a virtue? (laughs) Okay, well, first of all, let me tell you that um, I have in my tongue and my cheek right now, I have no idea what it's like to be choleric and melancholic and a high achiever, a perfectionist. What's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And <laughs> I discovered I needed virtues. The background is that I, uh, you know, I became a Catholic when I was in my 30s. So I, I had grown up in, a, in an alcoholic family. Where what happens then is for a lot of people is you kind of grow up not knowing how to act. You know, there are not the normal responses to situations. So you're not quite sure what the right response is. So after I was received into the church, I signed up for a five-year study group on the Summa Theologica taught by the same Dominican priest who received me into the church. What I learned is that the one third of the summa that, you know, like 800 of the 24 pages is on the virtues. And I glommed onto those and I thought, this is what I need. These virtues have names. They have definitions. You can know whether you're doing this or not. And I just fell head over heels in love with it because it finally gave me that moral compass that would point me directly at Jesus Christ. That's how I got Uh, interested in the virtues was in the early 90s. And so a virtue is a strength of character that helps us to do the right thing. It is is more than a habit. Sometimes virtues in a sort of a shorthand are called habit, but they're beyond habit because they have become a kind of second nature to us. And so when you read sometimes that a virtue makes doing uh, good, easy, and joyful, you know, you got to take the easy part with a grain of salt um, and even the joyful part sometimes, but easier because we have practiced it so much that it's become a part of it. So Thomas Aquinas said, virtue makes a person good. That's a huge concept, makes a person good. So if I am modest, it means that I am a modest person. It's not a quality that I have tacked on to me. If I'm a patient person, I have that quality, which means I'm patient most of the time. It's not just something I say, oh, I have a habit of this. It's really me now because it's the Holy Spirit having transformed me into that person with that virtue. And the cool thing is that every virtue we get Uh, stronger at, it takes all the other virtues with it. We grow in all the virtues as we grow in one. Oh, that is one of my favorite things about virtue. I remember when I learned that because sometimes it can feel like we're not focusing on maybe the quote unquote right virtue, or we don't know which one we're supposed to be growing in. But when we grow in one, we really do grow in all of them, which is great because I don't think many people know what all of the virtues are. I remember when I learned magnanimity, I remember thinking, what is that word? I don't even know if I can remember this word and all of the others. We know some like temperance, prudence. Those might be more well-known virtues, but what are some of maybe the lesser known virtues that we could be praying for? Well, let's take magnanimity. Um, The root of that word is, and especially good for business people, the root of that word, you know, magna, big, right? Anima, soul. So it means big souledness. And what that means in practice is that I am willing to trust God enough to discern if he wants me to do something that really gets me out there, really takes, takes a risk, 
And if I feel that nudge from the Holy Spirit, if I have the virtue of magnanimity, I will trust God to, to, to make that happen. So I'm willing to step out there. I'm willing to increase my reach. I'm willing to get out and speak in front of an audience or whatever it takes to let God operate in the biggest way that he wants to in what I do. Uh, sometimes uh, there's, you know, that there's a word magnificence, believe it or not, means that it, you manage large amounts of money well. So that goes in, sort of goes with magnanimity because, because uh, sometimes big projects take a lot of money and you mm -hmm. need to be, uh, manage that well. So let's see, what else? Um, well, chastity, of course, but I think, I think most of your audience is going to understand that chastity means that everyone is called to be chaste in their state of life. It doesn't just mean no sex. It means that you thought if you're married, you are, you are, you are loyal to your spouse. And if you are single, that you, you remain chaste. Equity is kind of an interesting one, especially in this day and age when equity is so misused. Equity actually happens in, uh, I think it happens in real, in, in everyday life, but it, particularly for the justice system, it means, when, it means that when a judge goes sort of beyond the law, but in a holy way, he kind of looks at all the circumstances. I think it would have to do a lot with uh, raising children. When you've laid down your rules, a child breaks the rules, um, but somehow you take the circumstances into, into account. So equity means that you're using your common sense beyond the rule to do something even more just than the rule would have said. Ooh, I like that. So when we're thinking of virtue, how do we grow in virtue? For example, we may hear patience is a virtue, right? We're in our workplace, our coworker is driving us crazy, or maybe it's our boss who's always looking over our shoulder. We feel like they don't trust us to do our own job. What are ways that we can grow in virtue in those situations? First of all, practice, but practice what? Um, you know, you hear people say count to 10 or, you know, breathe or something. Yes, those things might help some people, but they never helped me. Maybe I'm too choleric. Once I get my nervous system riled up, it's hard to calm it down. So I have to just override it with uh, you know, the limbic system, the, the amygdala, which is at the base of our skull in the back, that's the, the fear center, the one that's always looking for threats. So when it feels threatened by that coworker who has blamed us again for her mistake, we need to then somehow find a way, whatever works for us, to get our thinking brain, which is the frontal cortex in our forehead, to take over and say, you are not going to die. You don't have to take this personally. She's doing what she's doing, and this doesn't have to steal your peace. I believe in my teaching, I love mixing the mystical with the practical, because I think we all need, first of all, the mystical reason why we are doing this. Why are we doing this? Because we want to be more like Christ. We want to practice for heaven and not practice for hell by taking revenge, uh, evil revenge, unjust revenge, and so forth. So we want to practice for heaven because that is the destiny God has in mind for us. How do we do that? I believe in very practical things to find one that works for you and do that and practice that. And you actually will find yourself taking things less, less personally, which for me is the bottom line. Once I can do that, I just read a recent one, uh, G.K. Chesterton said that what he does is look at the other person as if they were a character in a novel. Mm. So you know how much we enjoy annoying people in novels. I mean, we kind of like, you know, we want to see them get whatever because we're not involved. Well, what if we weren't, what if we didn't take personally what they're doing and see them as they're living their own story? My mother's way of doing it was, his reality is not my reality, is that, which that's the phrase she would use. So there are lots of hacks to, to use in patience and all the virtues. 
uh, not to against lust, let's say, if you're, we're having a lustful thought, I love the phrase, which I heard from a priest, don't take the second look. Mm -hmm. So if you see something that might cause lust to flare up, then you just say, don't, don't take that second look, look at God instead, instead. And that's really, you know, even if our feelings don't change, we've done the thing that brings us closer to God. We're building that virtue, even if our feelings don't change. Yeah. I think of, you know, avoid the mere temptation of sin. So often we focus on the sin itself, but we don't pay attention to the thing that is leading us there in the first place. So tracing it back, if I know that I am more prone to the sin when I am extra tired, you know, maybe it's gluttony and I keep overeating every single night and then I feel sick and then I wake up and I feel guilty that I ate all of this food. Well, if I know that I eat in that state when I'm overly tired, how can I avoid the kitchen when I'm overly tired? Those types of things, if we can just trace it back, or if I know that I drink too much and then I make poor choices, well, maybe don't meet your friends at the bar. Meet your friends somewhere else where alcohol is not a temptation. So just tracing it back to what is the thing that happens before I sin, not as what is happening as I sin, I think is often really helpful. That is such a great point, such a great strategy. And I suppose we could even start that chain of leading us not, you know, to, to, to the virtue rather than the sin. We could start that by simply asking God for the virtue at the beginning of the day. Which was my exact next question. How should we be praying for virtue? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny because I'm not sure that I do that exact thing. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me at the beginning of the day. And I, I look at the crucifix. I'm looking at him right now in front of my computer. But, you know, if we have found that we are, that there's a pattern there, we've been, you know, in our exam and that we've been bringing, we've been noticing that sin, we bring it to confession a lot. Yes, absolutely. Great strategy to pray for a particular viewed virtue. I could probably do that a little more myself. Yeah, I think this is where having a plan of life is really helpful, too. I know when I work with clients and we outline what their plan of life is, which you can certainly do on your own, but sometimes it's helpful to have someone else help you to reflect. Just picking one single virtue, because again, we know if we focus on one, we're going to grow in all of the others and sticking with it. And maybe you stick with it for months or even a year, but just having that particular virtue and tracking as you do your exam at night or as you're reflecting in the evening, how did I do with this particular virtue today? And I think that often we find, and I've heard women say this, I don't want to pray for it because I'm scared the Lord's going to give me the opportunity to practice it. Yeah, true. Often it does happen that way, at least in my own experience. I'm praying to grow in the virtue of something. And then I find that I did absolutely terrible at it for several days in a row because that opportunity showed up so often. But that is how we grow. And that's part of the process. So if that happens to you, I just want to encourage you, don't beat yourself up over it. It's going to happen. We grow in virtue by practicing virtue. God cares about our will more than anything else. What do we will? And does our will align with his? So as I said, you know, before, even if our feelings don't necessarily change, we're doing the thing. Um, and even if our behavior doesn't necessarily change, our will if we have prayed for that virtue and we're concentrating on it, God, God sees where our will is. And uh, humility is a good virtue, too. So maybe he's te uh, teaching us a little bit of that. He's in charge of our holiness. We can't decide what and when this happens, but our will is in the right place. That's the important thing. Mm, yes, I love that. So when I talk to women about feeling like they are called to more, which part of this is this growth in virtue, but also doing more in the world, feeling like they're supposed to be doing something beyond what they are doing right now, but they feel stuck in the everyday toils of being a mom, of just the everyday obstacles. I often hear that the thing that is holding them back is their lack of knowledge, either certification or experience or finances. But when we dig a lot deeper into that, we often find that really isn't the issue. 
the root of the issue is often a lack of trust in God. They want certainty that things are going to work out. They want to be in control. What are some ways that we can renew trust in God when it seems to be slipping away? Mm. Yeah, I'm just going to interpret your word they as we, because I'm going to include myself in that. Yes, absolutely. I will include myself. <laughs> oh. All right. Let me give me a second here. I believe that when I feel that way, which is a constant tendency, that I have not spent enough time in adoration. Mm. It's in front of the tabernacle or the monstrance. And if if that is impossible for people, which I, there have been times in my life when it's been, you know, more difficult than others, the, the quiet time with the breathing, but sitting in front of our Lord really puts things in context. And it lets us hear our let's let's our hearts hear his voice. One of the things I love about adoration, even when it feels like nothing's happening, is I say, Lord, transform me, you know, do surgery on me right now. Change me. Do your work in me, even if I can't feel anything. And he does. I've heard so many people say that even if they don't feel anything when they're there, they feel it later. They can say, oh, wow, that was definitely a product of my having gone to adoration. That's my number one is because it means that we have, as you said, we've our trust in God has dimmed. We're starting to rely more on ourselves and our thoughts and our plans and our desires and less on him, and that will always get us into trouble. Just like it did Eve. We bite that apple of our self-will, and we're inviting evil in, actually. Um, the evil of envy, the evil of self-doubt. Well, God-doubt, the evil of God-doubt. And if we park ourselves in front of the good, even for a few minutes, if we can do that, we will be infused with that good. Again, he will see that our will is to do his will because we show up. What I call derriere in chair, we show up to be with him in prayer. And he will always reward us for that. So... It kind of leads me to your your uh, thought before of what do we do to avoid that? What do we do to avoid that is to um, go to adoration more, have that quiet time with God more. If we feel our self-will like horses taking the stagecoach, you know, running amok, about to go into the ditch, that's our signal that we need to check in with God, period. I think that's, that's the cure. Yeah, having consistency. And trusting that he desires to be one with us. He desires that oneness with us as we sit before him. And a thought that's always really helpful for me that a priest told me once on a retreat was trusting that the greatest graces are yet to come. So even if you go on a four-day silent retreat and you don't feel anything while you're there, trust that the greatest graces are yet to come. They will come even if you don't feel them in the moment. And I absolutely love that. And St. Teresa of Avila talks about that so much as you read through her mansions, those first three mansions, the beginning where many of us stay for most of our lives because we quit on the consistency. We give up because we don't feel anything. We think that maybe nothing's happening. So what's the point? We just want the constant, the feel good consolation or sometimes that spiritual candy. But if we know better, if we know that God sees our efforts, we just have to keep showing up those greatest graces are going to come and i really think that that's where that renewed trust comes from and it won't slip away if we stay consistent in going to him yeah our growth in good will not slip away if we stay consistent in growing with in closeness to him um which means that we shouldn't beat ourselves up if we miss a day as well Absolutely. Um, what came to mind when you said the greatest grace is, I mean, again, different things work for different people. So let me just add this to that. And my way in is the greatest graces are happening right now. 
even if I can't mm -hmm. see it. A, God doesn't know how to do small things. So he is doing great things through my efforts because I will to do his will. And that also means that my everyday things that, that don't seem very important are also expanding his kingdom in a greater way than I can imagine. I think one practical thing to do when you feel like nothing's happening or it's not happening fast enough which, from what I understand, even from Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, she feels like that. So it's a, it's just a, it's just the nature of being in business. It's never happening fast enough. So let, that's just a given. But I think to go back to Jose Maria Escrivá's writing, almost anything he wrote, read it. You know, meditate on it. And because he is the one who drew out this idea of universal call to holiness, that our everyday actions of lay people are leading us to sainthood. So if we keep in mind that sainthood is what we're going for, and our everyday actions are, are leading us to sainthood, to being saints, I should say, to being saints, then what do we have to worry about? That's always my sort of the starting point I always bring myself back to. It is happening. I am getting holier. God is doing great things with my efforts. What more do I want? He wants heaven for me. And if I say yes, that's where I'm, I'm going to end up. What more do I want than that? Mm. Takes me back to scripture of count it all as joy in the trials. And mm -hmm. I, yeah, I love that perspective too of God doesn't know how to do small things. He's always going to do greater things than we could even imagine. And just the reminder to not beat yourself up. You are going to miss your prayer time. It's going to happen. And there are going to be days where you have to discern if that is the best thing. Maybe you have sick kids at home or something is coming up with your own health and you have to say, okay, I need rest today and I need to set these other things aside. And St. Jose Maria Escriva has a quote, which I'm sure I'm going to mess up, but he talks about if we can't find God in the ordinary everyday things, surely we will never find him. So in those ordinary everyday things, if we are seeking God and we have our heart turned toward him, he's going to meet us there. And that is where that trust is going to continue to be cultivated. So beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Not only is he going to meet us there, it's the place he himself has chosen for all eternity where we should be right now. Mm, amen. So talking about prayer, you talked about sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, sitting in adoration. What are some other keys to prayer that you teach in some of your courses? Mm -hmm. Right. In my pray, I have a program called Pray Like a Saint. And where it came from was I was, I'd been teaching the virtues starting in 2013. And, you know, I have a membership group uh, called Virtue Circle where we learn about virtues. But in 2019, I realized, you know, no one is going to grow in virtue without a great prayer life. So I thought I'd better focus more on prayer because I'd, I want people to really, really grow in virtue. That is what, I, what I'm all about in my career and in my life. So I started with a five-day challenge in 2019. It morphed into a five-day online course, but I realized no one's going to get a great prayer life without some coaching as well. And you do marvelous coaching uh, with people in, in helping their prayer life. The way that I do it is a little different, and that is that I have the nine weeks of what I call snackable videos, 10 minutes or less. So it's about 30 minutes a week that you spend on the course for people who don't have time. And then the weekly coaching. So you get the weekly coaching so you can't get stuck and get all your questions answered. I find that this is finally I found the, the key to actually having people have that transformation from not being sure if they're doing it right or not being able to find the time. It's actually quite easy to find the time. And any other issues they have, the distractions and all the other stuff. 
that at the end they have a prayer life that feels joyful and natural. It's a custom prayer life for them this season in their life. And so some of the hack that I guide people through is to switch. So if prayer has become boring and you feel like you're just checking that box, you're just going through the motions, switch it up. Find another way to pray. Find a way to pray that you like. There are so, so many. In my program, I have something called a prayer smorgasbord. And it's a whole bunch of different choices. You can mix and match and, and just find the one that is that you love right now. There's no reason to pray boring prayers. Does God put us in dry times sometimes? Yeah, he does it. Does it for our good? You do it anyway. And you do it because more, actually more. I'm sure you've said this a million times to your audience, Kylie, because you know it so well, that you, you there's actually more grace brought down by dry prayer in a dry time than it is when you're getting the, the feel good. Mm -hmm. So we do stick with it no matter what, uh, because that's, you know, we're in this with God and he's in it with us and we're, we're glorifying God. We're saving souls. I always bring myself back to that. When we're praying, we're saving souls from hell. This is, I feel like such a grown up, you know, I get to help God do that. This is so cool. So what do I care if I'm, you know, not feeling it completely this day? Who cares? I'm just going to do it anyway. Yeah, I always take that back to our relationships with our spouses or even our children. Sometimes we don't have the feel goods around our spouses or our children either, but we still show up for them anyway, because that's what love is. We are choosing to do good for them anyway. We are willing the best for them. And same with God. It might not always feel good when we show up, but if you can't show up out of love in the beginning, then you show up because maybe it's obligation and you grow in love through that process. And it's really beautiful. And I love that you talked about switching it up. Again, I'm reading St. Teresa of Avila right now. So that's why she is so prominent on my mind. But she talks about, for some of us, we don't have that imaginative prayer life. We can just close our eyes and place ourselves in the scene like St. Ignatius speaks about. And that can be a challenge. But there are other ways that we can start to strive for recollection, whether it's utilizing a book. And sometimes it's as simple as opening the book. The reading about the saints for me personally, I know is so helpful when I'm really stuck in dry prayer. If I just read a couple of passages, often that is enough for me to get to that place where I can sit and be quiet and not be so distracted by all the things. Scripture is excellent as well. But if you're doing the daily readings, and that's not cutting it in the moment, maybe you go back to a Bible study where it's structured a little bit differently to help you kind of cultivate what it is that you need, or you pray in a different place, go outside, something like that. Yeah, beautiful. All great ideas, because you're an expert on this. Yeah, I always suggest that everybody has a go-to book right next to where they're praying, so they can grab it during those times. And it's pre-chosen, like you were talking about. Back up and find out where how where you can start so that you have a good outcome. And for me, it's that go-to prayer book. For me, it's Abandonment to Divine Providence by Jean-Pierre Cossad. But, you know, other people, it's going to be scripture. Just whatever your book is where you know you can open it up anywhere and and be inspired and get in the God zone. That's That's a really good hack. Yes, I love that. Okay, you have had a journey from your conversion to not just becoming Catholic, but now wanting to teach others how to become better Catholics through prayer, through growing in virtue, through aspiring to be saints. But we know that joy does not come without a lot of pitfalls along the way. Would you mind sharing some of those in the basement moments that you've had in your journey and how you have learned to still find joy in those moments. Right. The secret for me is that I switch from what my heart feels to what I know. And I always come back. We're going to talk about my favorite Bible verse in a minute, but it's very much tied to that, that I revert to I know. And I, sometimes I'll just say it out loud. If I'm going through a painful time, a sorrowful time, a frustrating time, 
I know that God, as Bishop Barron says, loved me into existence. He loved me into existence for a reason. I am living out that reason right now. How do I know that? Because I asked him to guide me, and he's going to do that. So when joy is in the basement, it's still there. That's my point. You have to go find it where you can find it. And different people are going to do it in different ways. With me, it's reminding myself of what I know to be real and true. A beautiful quote by Elizabeth Ann Seaton applies to this. She says, we must often draw the comparison between time and eternity. There's the key. Think about eternity and not time. Time is passing away. Everything we see in front of us, everything that's making us sorrowful is passing away and will be gone someday. Joy is eternal. Joy is never going anywhere. So we must often draw the comparison between time and eternity. This is the remedy of all our troubles, she says. How small will the present moment appear when we enter that great ocean? So it's switching our focus on what is passing away, what is temporary, to say, I'm practicing for heaven right now. That's my desire. I want to connect myself with the eternal God who is love, who is joy. And I'm making that intellectual decision to do that. Mm, that's beautiful. I just want to add to anyone listening, if you don't have that desire to focus on heaven, to focus on the eternal, pray for that desire. Like, I want to want this desire for things eternal. I want to want the desire for things that are not of this earth. And you are going to have moments. I know this is something I had a client once. She's like, but I don't want to do that. I know that's what I'm supposed to want to do, but I don't want to. In this moment, I want to self-indulge. I want to feel sorrow and I want to eat away my feelings. You will have moments where you feel like that and it is okay. But if you continue to go back to prayer, the virtue sometimes suddenly without even any effort as you continue to grow through the spiritual stages, the virtues will come and those desires will come. But in the beginning, we have to put in more of the effort than you may later on in life. So if you follow the lives of the saints, Sometimes there's a lot of work early and sometimes things come easier for different people. So if you're looking around and it seems like their prayer just comes so natural, they're not distracted. That doesn't affect you in any kind of way. You just focus on the things that God is giving you in that moment and continue to progress. And again, pray for the grace to want the eternal. I love that so much, what you said. I just want to eat my feelings away right now. Um, and I just don't even want that. I, I, I'm so mad, you know. It, what you said was so beautiful. Because, yes, this is, so you can say, this is where I am right now. If we can say those words, this is where I am right now, God. You know, if you want something better for me, and I know you do, give me the desire. I'm just a little kid, and and I'm getting into the mud, and I need your help to do anything differently, because I can't. That is the most beautiful prayer. And it means that, you know, with that prayer, God comes so close to us, and we get so close to God, because we admit we need him. Yes. Okay, you have a Virtue in Business Summit coming up. Will you share what that entails and who it is for? Yes, it's for anybody. Actually, it's any any Catholic professional. It's going to be sort of uh, a slant to our people who own their own business. But because uh, virtue is generic, it's for everyone all the time. I think everybody will find it interesting. It's just in a business context of how do I practice virtue in my business? So far, the people who have agreed to be speakers are fantastic. There's someone who is the right-hand man of a man named Alexander Havard, who wrote the seminal book in Virtuous Leadership. Um, and we're going to learn about how our temperaments 
affect which virtues we're better at. And I think that's something you talk about a lot. It absolutely is. I talk about that all the time. It's something I work with people on when I coach them. (laughs) Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So there's going to be Lorraine Bennett, who wrote a book called The Temperament God Gave You, is going to be a guest. It's in kind of blanking, but yeah, there are are just people who have been extremely successful in Fortune 500 companies who are Catholic, who are virtuous. And how do we mash those two things together, being virtuous and being very successful? in our business. Um, so that's going to be June 17th to 19th. And uh, Emily has generously offered to put a link to the registration in the show notes, I guess. So yep. uh, yeah, sign up. I would love, love, I think you will love uh, what you're going to hear there. As we wrap up, I always ask my guest for either a prayer tip or a favorite scripture verse. You have provided Luke 1, chap- sorry, Luke chapter 1, verse 45. Blessed is she who believed that the Lord's promises to her would be fulfilled. Can you elaborate on that? It's been my favorite uh, Bible verse for many, many, many years. And it is because of the word believed. Again, the way to my heart is through my intellect. I have to know, and that's like one reason I love theology and love the virtues. The more I know about God, the more I love him. That's just the way it works with me. So blessed is she who believed. It is my faith that needs to be strong. And what is faith? It is, it is assenting to what is actual reality. It's not believing some pie in the sky. It's believing what is true, what has been revealed by God Almighty himself. And so if I be, continue to believe in reality and not the uh, and not the lies that are being whispered in my ear all the time by my enemy or by my imagination, I will stay close to God. I will end up in heaven and take as many people with me as possible. And that is the goal of my life. This is my favorite part about sharing the scripture verses. Earlier, you said you have to switch from what your heart feels to what you know is true. And if we can't hear God, if we don't have that relationship where we can always hear the shepherd's voice, and even if you do have a great relationship, sometimes you can't hear him because there's noise around you and those lies creep in. But the way that we know what is true is by going back to scripture. And so if we can remember even one or two scripture verses and have those memorized as our go-tos that can help us remember what is really true, that is what helps pull us out of those moments where we want to eat away our feelings. That is what pulls us out of those moments where we want to throw in the towel and not do the thing that God's asking us to do because we say, it's too hard. It's not for me. Someone else should just do it. I don't have the skills. I don't have the stamina. I have social anxiety. I can't possibly get in front of these people and speak. We go back to what we know is true. And that is a wonderful verse. Thank you so much for being here, Rose. It is such a blessing. I can't wait to see how the Lord continues to use your gifts. And again, for anyone who is interested in signing up for Rose's Virtue in Business Summit, or if you are interested in any of her other programs, you can find her links in the show notes. Thanks so much, Kylie. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Hey, everyone. I know some of you are new here. So if you have not downloaded the Daily Examine for Every Temperament, This is an excellent free resource that you can get from the show notes. Based on your temperament, you will be provided a list of vices that you may be more prone to and virtues that may come more naturally to you. Be sure to check it out. Also, I am down to just two one-on-one coaching spots left for the summer. So if you are interested, be sure to jump on that free confidence and clarity call. There's no commitment, but let's chat and see how I can help you. Coaching not only makes your life feel easier and more manageable, your life really does become easier and more manageable because you have the tools and resources to get through those tough moments and stop the roller coaster drama of stress and overwhelm that comes from wanting to do all the things, striving to do all the things, and that inevitable feeling that comes from no matter what you do, feeling like you're letting someone down. So, Let's stop that cycle. Let's make things easier and jump on a call with me today.
Beautiful souls, thank you again for journeying with me. If you have been blessed by this episode, it would mean the world to me if you would leave a review. Be sure to screenshot it, share it on your social media stories, and don't forget to tag me on Instagram or Facebook at Kylie M. Hine. Stay persistent in prayer, protect your peace, and as always, share the light of Christ with everyone around you. 